Thank you for being here this evening. Welcome to LACMA. Um, this evening's, well, I should introduce myself first. My name is Bindi Gude. I'm the Associate Curator of South and Southeast Asian Art here at LACMA, here at LACMA and um, one of the curators of the Sri Lanka exhibition that is on view in the Resnick Pavilion. And it's actually in connection with that exhibition that we're holding this event tonight. Um, that exhibition, The Jeweled Idol, uh, Art from Sri Lanka, is on view through July 7th. And I hope many of you have seen it or will have a chance to see it. It presents nearly two millennia of Sri Lanka's artistic history, um, artistic and cultural history, through some 240 artworks that are diverse in their authorship, patronage, media, subject matter. Um, but the exhibition, with the exception of one work, doesn't really extend beyond the 1950s, um, which is why we're especially glad tonight um, to be able to have this opportunity to discuss contemporary art. And before I proceed any further, I really need to extend um, a big thank you to the Consul General, <laughs> Swarna Gunaratna, who has been of such immense help to us throughout um, the course of our exhibition and even now with her presence and support at events. Um, I also want to thank Kristen Benson of Lackman's Education Department, who helped to put this event together on very short notice. Um, and also Susan Bake and Joshua Hashemzade. Um, we at LACMA didn't realize as we were organizing our exhibition that Susan <laughs> was um, planning an exhibition of contemporary Sri Lankan art at uh, her gallery, Bake Art. Um, that show is on view now, and I would really encourage all of you um, to see it. It's <clears throat> entirely due to this um, fortunate coincidence that we're able to have with us today um, Jagat Wirasinga, who has been the driving force in the development of Sri Lankan art since the early 1990s. <laughs> Jagat uh, has, the unique has a very unique perspective, actually, um, having attained uh, a, a background as both an artist and an archaeologist. He obtained a BFA in painting at the Institute of Aesthetic Studies um, at the University of Kelania uh, in Sri Lanka in 1981. In 1985, he received a degree in wall painting conservation from the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property in Rome, which he followed up in 1988 with further studies at the Getty Conservation uh, Institute in Los Angeles. In 1991, Weirasinga obtained an MFA from the American University in Washington, D.C., and it was following his return to Sri Lanka in the early 1990s that Jagat helped to shape the politically conscious contemporary art pra praxis of the 1990s in Sri Lanka. He co-founded uh, the Tirtha International Artist Collective in 2000, and until recently was a director of the Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology at Kelania. There's probably no better person to explore contemporary Sri Lankan art with, and we're very thrilled to have him here tonight. So, Jagat and I have had the opportunity to meet um, several times over the past week, and I've learned a lot, actually, from talking to you. Like things that, you know, Sri Lankan art is just not really discussed in many, you know, of sort of these surveys of contemporary Asian art, even of contemporary South Asian art. And I think even, even if it were, it's really difficult to get a sense of all of the many strands. And I hope that we'll be able to convey some of that to our audience tonight because it's just, it's been exceptional actually talking to you about it the last few days. But I think, Maybe we should like start at the very beginnings. Um, and I believe, I think I left my slide advancer up here. Oops. Um, I think it might be important to really begin at the beginnings of sort of what we might call like sort of, you know, the modern. <laughs> in Sri Lanka, which as in many of these other um, Asian nations, and particularly South Asian nations, you know, which have a history under colonialism, really begins with this uh, sort of adoption of uh, Western techniques often learned through colonial art schools into the depiction of traditional subject matter. And I wonder if uh, 
you can comment on. <laughs> what you see here is um, an artist called M. Sarlis. He's a Buddhist muralist, a mural painter. He painted uh, mostly in the uh, Buddhist temple that came up in the, in the early 20th century along the coastal belt of Sri Lanka. What is important and interesting about M. Sarlis is, in my opinion, he is probably the first self-conscious modernist artist who was painting Buddhist murals because he signed his paintings as M. Sarlis artist. He signed himself, and then he's an artist. And he also, in some paintings, painted uh, Winston Newton paint tubes. Willow is a uh, signature. And he introduced so many new things about uh, into the visual culture of the time. He was one of the most popular among the, not the elite class of Sri Lanka, not the cultural elite, but the general public. He was the artist for the general public. So. So for a long while he was not considered within art historical writing because he was so kitsch to begin with. You know, his as you can see. But in a way it's not unlike Ravi Varma in um, India. Yes, yeah. I mean at, in their in their time, you know, these artists were lauded really for um, you know, for depicting something in a new in a new style and you know, in a fashionable way. And and his paintings I know were disseminated even in print form, you know, yeah. so there was like this mass consumption in the same way that you know, the Ravi Varma oleographs were, but then, but then there's a turn away from this, yes, um, but a yes. disavowal of this, you know, sort of the kind people, of training. The, the people who patronized mm -hmm. him was the newer rich of that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a whole different class and a whole different aesthetics that he was establishing, which only now we are taking seriously you know, at, from an art historical point of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's followed, um, you know, by other artists like Solius um, Mendes. Um, you know, and this is a mural of his at the Kalania Raja Mahavihara in the 1930s and 40s. And this is sort of what exists before there's, um, you know, kind of a, a new, <laughs> fresh um, sort of set of influences that come in with this group. Um, yeah. known as Group 43. Um, and for those of you who may not know, I'll just point out... Go on. Moving like that. That's pleasant. Yeah. This thing is moving on its own. <laughs> <laughs> Bindu, so, if you, if you um, go back to uh, Solius Mendes... You want to go back? Yeah. <clears throat> There's something very interesting. Though. It, when Solis Mendes was painting these murals in another very famous, politically powerful Buddhist temple in Kalania, the, the other guy, M. Saris, was also painting about five kilometers or ten kilometers away, in a very different style, but the same subject matter, but for the same people. And at the same time, this is 1930s, George Keat, the great modernist artist of Sri Lanka, he was painting another Buddhist temple mm -hmm. in the in the Cubist style. So what is interesting to note this multi styles existing, coexisting at the same time. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the kind of Sri Lanka that I envision. I always think it is it, it, it is open to so many diverse styles at, at the same time. Okay. We'll come to that point later on. <laughs> <while I'm laughs> emphasizing on that multicultural, multi stylistic approaches to the single thematic that is Buddhism. But it's said in so many different ways. Yes, definitely, and you definitely see it even in the contemporary approaches. But this is a very famous yeah. sort of group portrait of the members of Group 43. And, um, and they consist in the center of you know, the figure of Lionel Went, who was a Sri Lankan of Dutch burger descent, who you know, was sort of a core figure in this group. And figures like Harry and Ivan Perry's. Um, Ivan Perry's collect. Yeah. The figure at the top is George Cade, um, Aubrey Collette at the top right, who drew, you know, this caricature, um, and, and then Manu Darwin Gala, and then the Man Manjushri. And, you know, but what's interesting about this group is, you know, they all spurned, like, this colonial art training, um, and they each embraced yeah. sort of a different kind of... Now, now we come to them. This is the look at artist from the English-speaking cultural elite of the time. And M. Sarlis and Solis Mendes are from the rural, um, non-English speaking. Uh, they're coming from a different class. So the 43 group called, uh, identified themselves as modernist. 
and they were working in a style taken from the Ecole de Paris, you know, the, the Paris Museum. But so you see, you know, there's there's an interesting point there. Like you know, when, when Sri Lankan art teaching was carried out by the colonial art schools, it was academic realism. But the, these people, the 43 group, was kind of fight, uh, struggling against it while coming from the same class. So they were the first. And they styled themselves as it yeah. was a nationalist yeah. you know, kind yeah. of a yeah. rejection. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and here are some works by some of these artists in the 1940s um, Clayson, Mother and Child, um, Justin, Daran Yangala, A Blind Mother and Child, um, <coughs> Richard Don Gabriel. You, you know, see, the, you know, Sri Lanka has this <laughs> bucolic past, the village, and, you know, it's not the contemporary thing that they took. They, they always thought about the Sri Lanka as, as something belonging in the past, like the myths, uh, the Ramayana, the, all these stories. That is what they painted, mostly, <laughs> not totally. Um, like this, this is George Keane. Sort of, you know, a Cubist kind of approach to, you know, this heroine, poetic heroine. Um, a wonderful painting. This is Ivan Pierce. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, then there's this Lionel Lent, mostly, you know, well known for his photography and his experimentation with sort of, you know, these modernist sort of idioms and, you know, surrealism, for instance. This is from the 1930s. Um, so, you know, but what's interesting, I mean, all of those artists were, I mean, they all came from a certain social class, yeah. like this kind of uh, Europeanized, um, some, you know, mixed, hmm. you know, Sinhalese, like you uh, most of them were mixed Sinhalese, yeah. like European descent. Um, and then, you know, another break comes yeah. you know, with one of your own teachers, yeah, in fact. H.A. <laughs> Kamaratna is also my teacher, but he is an abstract, you know, he's, well, he studied at Pratt Institute, and then he studied at Kyoto, University of Kyoto, and he, he also married a Japanese uh, uh, person, and then you know, he he's, as you would see, that he, he's, a, he's getting his ideas about art from this, uh, what we call the international modernism, or Clement Greenbergian kind of modernism. So you took the abstract expressionist aspects, you took certain kinds of uh, abstraction, and then you wrap it with Buddhist spirituality. A good example from India is J. Swaminathan. Mm -hmm. You see, like this art became the national, uh, uh, the national art of the, in, the, in, the, in the in the 60s, because you know it is about spirituality in the end. Something transcendental. Tra something um, transcendental. Timeless. <laughs> so, but this is about 1980s. But but by this time, Sri Lanka is actually dripping away from being. I'm, I'm going to show them the slide that you put in here. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about this slide like, before you know, I make it. As Jagat puts this, it, like, you know, this, like, paradise lost, you know, in an instant. This is the Sri Lanka that, you know, we began to seriously think about doing art. It was not just colonial this problem. It's not, the enemy is not outside anymore. The enemy is already within us, right? So on this side you have the Sri Lankan army. Uh, that side, that's the uh, liberation tigers uh, of Tamil Elam, the guerrillas, and this is what we were experiencing most of the time. The, the idea of Sri Lanka as a paradise, as this beautiful island. Well, you know it already, and we are experiencing it again. <laughs> so it is, it is this. So what happened with this? You know, we'll come to that again and again in 19, since 1983. Like you know, this was the scene of up to 2009. So the kind of art that my teacher, H.A. Kavanaratna, whose work that you do, this art uh, did not give me enough space to tell my story through art, you know. So we wanted an art that can tell my story, more narrative. So it's in a way which is interesting, it's not just in Sri Lanka, across Asia in the 80s, Asian art Modern art takes what we call the narrative term. Like in India, mm -hmm. in China, in Thailand, everywhere, artists, a new generation of artists coming with an art form to tell stories. Yeah. 
Well, I think maybe this might be the place to start yours. <laughs> yep. um, and in fact, you know, sort of how your approach, like sort of what happened to you um, and your personal engagement with this. And I thought I would bring in this slide, um, which is from 2013, but it's, it's of the Dumbola, yeah. um, you know, cave mountain, basically. Um, and this has been a recurring motif yes. in your work, you know, since, I mean, Since 19, yeah, like 2000, 2004, like. Yeah, and you know, some of you, you will recognize the same image. This again is Dumbola, which we put on our event announcement for this. Um, but what it is, is this, this particular is site in Sri Lanka, um, you know, a massive uh, Buddhist cave, um, an exceptionally beautiful one. You, uh, you know, carved into the mountain. Yeah. And this I'm, is where. I'm now, <laughs> now I'm going to give a little bit of my biography. <laughs> After graduation uh, from the university with an arts degree, I went to Dambulla uh, as a trainee murals conservator. You see, this is a this is a major religious site. It has that nationalist pride held in this in this site. So when I was working here in the 80s. I was coming from Damula to Colombo on this terrible day in 1983. That was in 1983, July, Sri Lanka, southern parts of Sri Lanka goes into a major you know, anti-Tamil riot. The southern Sri Lankans go through this you know, killing and looting and, and attacking Tamils. So this is, I'll just explain the context. Yeah. This is Black July if any of, for any of those of you who know something about Sri Lankan history. And it was really, it's the point that, you know, even though there have been similar intentions, that really marks like this escalation of conflict between um, the Tamil and the Sinhalese, um, you know, groups. And partly because of, um, you know, LTT attacks upon a, um, group of a, a, yeah, a group of soldiers, killing several of them, which then resulted in retaliatory attacks that just escalated. And, you know, this beginning of some, you know, horrific violence so, that stays not only in your memory, but that yeah. other artists yeah, as well. Yeah, everyone, everyone of my generation. Mm -hmm. See, what happened to me is that, you know, well, once again, you know, a bit of biography. At the university, I was, I thought I'm a, I'm, I still think I'm a half-baked Marxist, yeah. and I was a student unionist, and I myself spent, was adopted and all that. And, but I thought I'm a, a, a very reasonable person. But when this carnage was happening in front of me, for a second, like, I thought, oh my God, this may, maybe this is not something that is, this is something inevitable, that, you know. But at that very moment, I also began to think, no, this is not inevitable. You know, this kind of things cannot happen right in front of me, and I, I as a Buddhist, cannot subscribe to that. So that changed my attitude, you know. I realized the, the monster of nationalism is hiding, is, is, is within you. That's what I first realized in 1983. Even after being a Marxist, and a student unionist, and I, my, I had a father who was a man who claims himself to be a Marxist, and everything, I, all of a sudden I realized there was something that I did not know in me. There was a radical other in me who is a racist, who is a nationalist kind of. That changed my, my, my thinking about myself, because I think I'm, I'm a single, and I'm a Buddhist, and I was kind of proud of it. Oh, nothing to say proud, but you know, mm -hmm. that's my subjectivity. And but then I never thought, even for a second, that I would be looking at it from a from passive point of view, rather than you know challenging myself against this carnage happening in front of me. Yeah. So everything changed for me, and and later on I realized everything has changed for everyone else in in Sri Lanka. But, I mean, it explains a lot of. You know, not only the Dumble imagery, mm -hmm. you know, which speaks to sort of this personal narrative moment, but then. You know, some of this, you know, the earliest yeah. images that you began to exhibit upon your return to Sri Lanka, you know, yeah. after studying abroad, when you and these other artists had that landmark exhibition yeah. Yeah. called yeah. Anxiety. Yeah. <clears throat> and these were some of the works that were in the in this show. And this it's this show with Jagat <clears throat> and other artists, Chandra Gupta, yeah. and Awara as well. 
and we'll see some of his works, um, you know, all reacting to this moment and, you know, all bringing their own, you know, personal narratives and assessments and anxieties, you know, into, um, into this exhibition. Yeah. And I think another thing, too, is in contrast to some of these earlier artists, you know, you're, you are all coming from different, uh, a different class, you know, of artists, you know, who were severely impacted, um, you know, by some of these things yeah. that were happening. So, with the, so this is called broken stupa, mm -hmm. you know, and this kind of created, uh, this kind of disturbed some people. Like in Sri Lanka, you either get ruined stupas, you know, they are ruined over time, or brand new, you know, neat and clean stupas. But there are no broken stupas in Sri Lanka. But in my paintings, when I did this broken stupa, well, I did not think about it that much, because this was about me. Like, you know, I'm carrying a broken stupa in me since 1983, like, this is how I was feeling. This is like, you know, very thing that I thought was putting myself as a complete person has broken within me. So I, this is what it, it, it meant for me, uh, the, the, the broken stupa. And you have to remember, like, you know, I was conserving Buddhist murals in Dambulla when all these things were happening. So I'm in one hand practically conserving the ancient Buddhist images and I'm breaking them on my paintings. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is, these are the contradictions of, of being in a particular time at a particular place. Yeah, but probably also watching the way you know yeah. the religion and these you know visual forms of religion are being sort of misused, um, yeah. you know, by those in power. But you know, Mis like, you know, any violence, any human violence at every scale is justified through a celestial or a divine argument. That's that's what we always do. You know, always it is some kind of a transcendental argument, we justify violence. At home, at, at, at public level, at state level. So, violence is necessarily it's made, made, made celestial. Okay, you kill the other person for the name of your religion. Anyway, we just experienced it <laughs> back, back in Sri Lanka, in, in Sri yeah. Lanka but last week. I want to actually, speaking to that, I mean, you, the, Another motif that kind of yeah. shows up in your work is this sort of like distressed physical body. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and you've done a number of these long neck man, like, you know, an extremely sort of disjointed kind of image that evokes a lot of anxiety. Um, but I want to actually, you know, in reference to sort of both the types of things that were happening in response to, um, you know, the Tamil. Hmm. Buddhist conflict, you know, go back to address also, you know, another uh, another conflict to which you alluded to um, earlier, but which I don't think very many people here in this audience really know about. But you know, we we often think of Sri Lanka, you know, as marked by this period of this civil war between 1983 and 2009. But you know, the there are a number of. Um, insurrections that are very brutally suppressed, student insurrections, you know, they're brutally suppressed by the government beginning, you know, in 1971, um, 88, 89. yeah, and in the late 80s, yeah. um, which also, like, really mark its history um, and, you know, this, this memory. Um, and this is a, a very well-known hmm. um, artwork that you created in response to a specific incident, in fact, um, that occurred in 89, yeah, 88, 89, 89 um, if you... Yeah, what happened was, you know, like, okay, when we were having a kind of ethnic war, so to speak, in the north uh, of Sri Lanka, there was uh, youth insurrections in the south of Sri Lanka in 88, 89, and then the army was pulled down south and it was suppressed. And in that suppression, you know, it was equally terrible. It is said that about 40,000 40, young men and women were, were killed. Mm -hmm. So These were teenagers. They were teenagers. Yeah, this particular case, yeah. this, this work is coming from, anyway, this is what happened. In a school in down south of Sri Lanka, 39 uh, school children were abducted and murdered. And, and they were all, you know, high school kids like. Yeah. And then they were, then their parents got to go then, uh, made something called, uh, got into a group called Mother's Front. And this, this Mother's Front 
supported Mrs. Uh, Her Excellency Chandrika Kumar Dunga when she was running for office, who became the president later on. And she, so she, that Mother's Front supported her and said, if you become the president, you have to give us our children a monument. And what happened was that monument landed on my, it came to me. I made that monument, it was also years later on. Actually, but, we could, I have a Yeah, this one, yeah, it's a <laughs> rather large monument. But what happened was when I was, in order to make this monument, what I did was I went to this village and spoke to all the parents and I, one of the main complaints or grievances of the parents was, you know, isn't the world has no concern about our suffering? You know, we lost our children. Nobody you know, has no, they don't care about it. And we couldn't give them a decent funeral. So what I did was I developed the ceremony. I made the parents and the artists, journalists who was uh, doing things against violence at that time. Uh, this was 1996, right? Mm -hmm. I invited them to that school. I made them sit on those tables. It was a performance art kind of thing. And I gave them wet clay tablets and asked them, you write the last thing that you want to remember about your children, about this incident for the future. So they all sat there. But then when I asked these mothers to come, they came in a very, very unique way. They came wearing white, white, white saris and white clothes. Each parent carrying an image of, uh, of the disappeared child. When I saw that, it, always, it reminded me, it struck me that this is exactly the way these parents go on a something called round pilgrimage. You know, in Sri Lanka we do something called round pilgrimage. We go from one temple, one sacred place to the other around the country invoking blessings for your children and in your family and all that. So I all of a sudden found this coincidence, this you know, overlapping these uh, these two things, in the same way that these parents at one point went from temple to temple invoking blessings for their children, they probably went from one torture camp to the other looking for their child. So I came out with this artwork called Yantra Gala and the Round Pilgrimage. Yantra Gala is this, uh, that, that, uh, that item. Yeah. Like a, it's yeah, at the foundation of all the Buddhist temples, which is the most sacred element. So I made this work and you know there are uh, photographs where female figures, uh, mothers figures working with images only to come into a burnt Buddha image. You see I have this you know, I'm a, I think I'm a, a very religious person but I have this problem with religion all the time. I think you know, religion if you bring it to contemporary politics it ends in violence. I'll come to that again. There's no other way. Religion cannot save us from our, our politics anymore. This is how I, how I feel. Maybe you, this is my opinion. This is, you know, I'm speaking from a... But this was a very powerful piece, I think. Yeah, and this was actually shown in, in the, uh, Asia Pacific, the third yeah. Asia Pacific Triennial uh -huh. in uh, Queensland. Um, you know, and this uh, notion of pilgrimage, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously it's something that continues in practice, but it's actually you know, immortalized in so much Sri Lankan art, in fact, you know, with the places of pilgrimage that are depicted, yeah, um, let, you know, yeah. in, let me in add some something more ancient know, material. About this pilgrimage. This pilgrimage is a very important ritual, like you know, even my mother used to do it, annual round pilgrimage. See, the round pilgrimage, when you do the round pilgrimage, you actually go to the four corners of the island and to the center, so to speak. Like, you know, we, we believe that Buddha, uh, Buddha, Lord Buddha, came to Sri Lanka and visited these sacred sites. So this round pilgrimage covers these major sites that Buddha supposed to have come. So there are there's a site in in Jatna, in you know. Mm -hmm. So once you de when you think about this round pilgrimage, you are also converting the land of Sri Lanka into a Buddhist land. Mm -hmm. And equally, <laughs> equally, the Tamils also have the uh, similar round pilgrimage. Good. God Karthikeya and God Shiva is in these cardinal places. They also have a, have a route, so no, no wonder we have a problem. <laughs> Both communities claim it as a spiritual land for themselves. And there have been sort of conflicts throughout yeah. history as yeah. to you know, who was there first. <laughs> but you know, I actually, I want to move on actually to talk about this, um, which you had just mentioned was, you know, these mothers, you yeah. said, had petitioned Kumaratunga to then, you know, construct this monument, which you were commissioned to build yeah. in 1999. 
And, um, but, you know, with the end of the war in 2009, you know, and this is another subject that comes up very frequently, and especially in a more recent generation of contemporary artists, is, you know, post that, under um, Rajapaksha, you know, post, you know, 2009, this sort of erasing, mm -hmm. um, you know, of history and of these scars of the war, in fact, of which your, your monument, in fact, is, a, you know, is a reminder. Um, this is actually work by, is, it, is Pradeep one of your students? Yes. Was he yeah. one of your yeah. students? So Pradeep Talawatka, and maybe you can, um, if all of you can <coughs> see, uh, he's actually carrying an image of your of monument time. to yeah. the innocents. And maybe you can yeah. explain a little bit. See, about what that happened context. was, you know, after the war, uh, this monument got erased uh, in order to develop the area. So this, uh, I want to tell you something about how politics of the South and the politics of the minorities, they work in two different ways. We in the South, politicians and the popular politics would like to forget the recent past and always hark back to the golden past of, of ancient Sri Lanka, the ancient glory of Sri Lanka. That is how the southern politics mostly work. They do, we try to forget the recent past. While in the north, they always try to remember, remind the recent past because, you know, that is how southern nationalism works by forgetting the recent past and harking back to the glorious past. Tamil nationalism works by reminding what the southern Sinhalese did to them. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so you know it is. So, so our work is actually more receptive, more received in in the north and in the east. Our kind of work, not in the, uh, uh, in, in, not in the, the status quo of the <laughs> of the south. No, this is a uh, uh, anyway. Yeah. So what's happening in this work actually is this what this is actually a video. Uh, a still from a video work yeah. by this artist, and he's carrying a, a painting of your Monument of the Innocent, built in 1999, but it was torn down in yeah. 2011, um, 11, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as uh, Jagat said, you know, as part of this beautification, redevelopment, you know, a shopping mall, I think. No, it's a, know, yeah, it's a water garden. It's a, a water garden. That's why that is uh, okay. going in the water. Okay. Yeah. So he's jumping up and down in a swimming pool, and, and throughout this whole exercise, you know, this painting is being erased. Um, you know, and so it was really sort of a meditation on sort of the destruction, both of his teachers, you know, <laughs> artwork in a way, but also you know this erasing of memory of, yeah. you know, of these atrocities. So there's a lot really that's going on, and there were many other artists. Yes. Um, you know, this is going back to sort of the the student, yeah. you know, insurrections this, and their suppression. Yeah, so, you know, there were mass suppression. graves in in, 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 huh. in the south of Sri Lanka. So uh, this is Kumar Dunga, the former president, at one occasion, you know, makes this program of you know getting you know digging these places, and these artists, you know, who actually spend time in torture in a, in a torture camp. Did this, you know, trousers? You know, when you know, most of these young students uh, were buried with their with their clothes, and and so when they when you are digging them, you know, you come across these trousers mostly, and so he made this artifact for those lost people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and he made all these. this no glory. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, in a way, going yeah. back to what these mothers yeah, yeah. were claiming that nobody's remembering, like these lost, you know, this lost like youth. What was, Sri Lanka. Let me tell you, like, you know, now, as you know, you, you, Bindu said this, you know, these kind of artists are coming from a very different uh, class, like, they are from the rural areas and the suburban areas. They are coming from non English speaking families. They are educated in the Sinhala schools in, in, in the rural areas. So these are the people in the 90, in 1990s, these artists coming from that class of people who were actually suppressed, brutalized. They were the real uh, oppressed people of the country. So they are coming out with their own aesthetics, to which I subscribe. I gave a theory, I, I gave a way to do that, uh, because they were most of my students. They, they sat in my artistic classes, they were in my painting classes, so I gave them a, a way. So it's in a way, uh, this may be a bit of an exaggeration, you know, <laughs> 
if you forget this ethnic aspect of it, what happened in Sri Lanka is the margins of the country attack the center. The southern margin, that is where all these you know, southern insurrections happened, and then the northern margin attack the center. So these, these attacks, these, they were kind of lost in the political arena. But artists from that same classes attacked the center in terms of its aesthetics. And they gave rise to a new kind of aesthetic. That is the beginning of the art of the 1990s. That questioned everything about what is beautiful in art. So, for example, these works were not received, were received by the art consuming Colombo art culture because you know there's no beauty. This is was the main question. How can it's, anyone live with this work? They it's are not still that way in, in, it in a way. It is still right? that like way. Main... Of course, you cannot live with this work. <laughs> No. But then they had to live with that, no? This we actually have to live we with. We can this. look at some more. Of this is from uh, Shanathana, I mean, one of the greatest, the greatest artist from Japna, contemporary yeah. artist. You know, he was the conduit between southern artist and the Japna artist. You know, he is painting this, you know, around the same time, the late nineties or early two thousands. Like you know, it's a, it's a corpse and a and a dog. You know, like the, the value of the human human life is is lost. And then Pradeep Chandrasiri. Yeah, Pradeep um, Chandrasiri is another artist from the south, you know, one of my students, you know. He did this like, you know, in the 88, 89 time, like, you know, it's a terrible story, but, you know, I'll make your life a little <laughs> unpleasant. <laughs> because, you know, the army or the paramilitary groups will come to your house and take your son. And in the morning you will find half burnt body but the extremities of the of your of, of your body will not be burnt so they will be like, like this, this. Had to do with gasoline, gasoline. And they do the, what they call the neck lacing they beat you like hell and then put a burning tire onto your neck mm -hmm. that's called a neck lacing terrible so this artist was taking those arms and he himself actually had been abducted yeah, by yeah, a yeah. paramilitary group yeah. i mean this is so much in so many of their yes, yeah. backgrounds yeah, like their yeah. own personal experience um, of this, and you know, it's, um, it's the same artist. Same artist. This image is actually coming from a real photograph of a young, young, uh, young child looking at several uh, burnt bodies by this famous uh, photographer, Stephen Champion. Mm -hmm. Stephen Champion took this photo. So most of us use this image in our work. Yeah. And this is, you know, apart from your work, you know, Chandra Gupta's work is actually also on view um, at Bake Art right now. But this is one of his, he was like you, um, yeah. you know, coming to maturity in the, uh, in the, yeah, in the 80s and 90s, like witness, because he's written himself also of what he saw yeah. in 1983. Um, and then I, w I was wondering if you could just talk about this. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about a little bit about the work. I came, I studied in Washington DC at the American University. He went to Moscow. He studied at the uh, Surikov Institute of Art. Mm -hmm. and he was, he's a really good uh, portrait uh, painter. You know, he, he has this great skill. He's a great artist. So, but he did was he trans translated that skill into painting barrels. You know, because in Sri Lanka during the war, barrels was ubiquitous. Barrels are controlling your, your uh, your movement, like there will be barrels with checkpoints. So the barrels became a defining uh, visual metaphor for the city at mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. So he called it barrelism, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's painted numerous things, and then you know he started introducing like this notion of sort of camouflage into yes, it. Yeah. I think, which you know, which really, uh, I mean, because Many there are sort of these this notion of sort of like you know, disguised messages or, you know, ambivalent messages. Um, and, and I think that you see that even in his even work today. Has that, you yeah. um, know. This is, he's now doing works like this, which are sort of like, you know. Uh, you know what, what is interesting, I don't know how to important is, you know, he's God. actually using the, that same attentiveness mm -hmm. of, if you are doing a portrait, mm -hmm. you know, he's trained as a very classical painter. He, he brings that creative energy into doing this work. He's called it a glitch, you know. 
Like there's a glitch yeah. in the system. <laughs> so, yes, there's a glitch yeah. in the system everywhere mm -hmm. now. And it's because if these are sort of stripes that have, you know, blank spaces in between them, like very meticulous, you know, application of paint in rows. And, and his notion is, you know, in our age, like with sort of digital transmissions and things like that, and the way information comes, like it, it's to him like a glitch. And it seems like a logical yeah. kind of continuation of his, you know, camouflage, like this incomplete picture in a way, or disguised image. Um, these are some of the yeah, you know, additional words of yours. You've in 2009, we entered mm -hmm. the war. And then, it's like, you know, then there was so much of euphoria you know, in South of Sri Lanka. And I was in like, okay, on those days, if you were driving, you, people would step, uh, stop you and make you drink, uh, eat milk rice. You know, you eat milk rice <laughs> as a celebration. I was, my car was also stopped and made me, I, I, I said, no, I don't want to eat it. <laughs> but then I, you know, I, that app also struck me something like, you know, yeah, the war ended, but at what cost? Like, you know, it is, I mean, like, LTT, the soldiers, and the human life, you know, we have lost so much. I mean, we should be happy that the war ended. There's no reason for you to be so happy about it. Let's take it as something great happened, you know, the war ended. But then, I realized, but you know, the world doesn't work, work that way. You, you find yourself, you know, I found a certain inflatedness in this glorious, additive, you know, the mood in, 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 at that time. So I made this, this series, this is also a bit uh, con controversial because if you, are, if you are from Sri Lanka, you know um, the Buddha uh, Purnima day or the Vesak. When we celebrate uh, the birthday of, of Buddha, we do this huge pandas with running uh, light. Mm -hmm. So I used that technique mm -hmm. into, uh, to these figures. These, are, well, these lights is running with someone. I think I have a couple of additional yeah. words from yeah. this series. See. You see, my, this is my problem with religion, because I'll come with, as I said, like, you know, when you bring religion into democratic politics, it always ends in violence. Nothing else. Nothing less, nothing less. That is exactly what it does. It only justifies the violence of the, of the powerful. And it, all, it is always a reason to oppress the marginalized. While I'm a very religious person, this is how I have come to realize it. So in this work, this is what I'm liking, and the microphones, the, the mass media, the communication power, you know, system in that we all use for that. We use all that. It's like the seduction of like yeah, the religious yeah, festival, yeah. Um, you know, and then also, you know, the, the seduction of these, um, it's like, you, you know, know snake-tongue politicians, really. It's like, you know, <laughs> The yellow color is a religious color in Sri Lanka, in India, and Thailand. But it's also the deadliest color in our part of the world. Because religion is behind all this, all this violence. You know? Think of Hindu politics in India. Think of our own you know, Sri Lankan politics, or in Thailand. Like, you know, so the yellow, uh, in, not only in my art, also in a uh, few of uh, Thai artists, they, they, we use the color yellow as a deadly color. It's a dirty color. It's a problematic. It's, you know, it's a violent color. There's a Thai artist who did this whole series called Yellow Peril. Mm. Hmm. I have to see that. But there are also parallels here with sort of like with, yeah. even some of this, with, this with, kind of imagery too, you know, where in evening cave temples, the yeah. paintings, this is Mara's army attacking the Buddha or tempting the Buddha um, just before his enlightenment. And you can see, you know, the color yeah. yellow, but, you know, but also just sort of like this this horde of figures, not unlike, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. have been drawing. Um, and this, you know, this concern with just sort of like the deceptiveness of, you know, yeah, you, you can, the ends to which religion is misused, yeah. is used by your artists. Your yeah, you can imagine why, why we are not, why we can never be the nationalist representation of Sri Lankan art, because now this artist, Bandhu Manampri, is also one of my students, is calling this instant nirvana. And the, these Buddhist images are um, kind of eroded with, in, in a camouflage uh, pattern. And so it is, you know, the use of, you know, this is something very interesting. We are all Buddhist and Sinhalese. We are questioning our complicity in the system. That is what we were mm -hmm. actually doing, like, you know. So, we were, you know, this, you know, this is a very problematic 
uh, was not problem, very challenging work to be to, to do those days, even today, like people find it very disturbing, like you know. But none of us are well, how do I say that? It's not about against Buddhism. This is also the contradiction, like you know, it is like this is how I see I, I see this in retrospect. As if we think that we can have a better religion. So we criticize how the religion is used now. But I now I realize, you know, no, there's no way. You better put religion in some corner in your home, not in the public. Anyway, and this is once again another, but like you know, this is you know you have seen this. It's a balustrade. But I, it's soon after 2009 I made this. You know, these balustrades are supposed to be heavy and on on the ground. But the euphoria that came after the oh, I said like it is an inflated one. It's going up there. It is losing its gravity. It's losing its dignity, so to speak. So I made this. Mm -hmm. see, you know. With the same, with the right? yeah, the sock yeah. kind of lights, yeah. um, and even Banu Manam Banu Manam 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 yeah. question, like you know this yeah. use, you know this other kind of are, <coughs> right? This is the moonstone that you see in the front of. In fact, the moonstone and the um, that very distinctive balustrade, you know, were mm -hmm. distinctive features of Sri Lankan architecture. And in fact, you know, to sort of use them. Um, um, in this way is sort of like questioning, you know, this sort of like the use of archaeology sometimes mm -hmm. even in some of these, um, you know, recent political endeavors. But I think maybe uh, this is also um, one of him. Mary with his... <laughs> He's a performance um, artist as well. He, he did this performance, you know, this particular series. We are doing this in Jaffna in 2004, you know, Go is not yet ended. So uh, that Jaffna artist, Tishanathanan, you know, he and we worked together. So he invited the southern artist to come and show how you guys suffered, uh, experienced violence in the south, because violence is not only happening in the north. So we uh, had a big show called Aham Puram. So for that exhibition, uh, Bangu did this performance, like a, a damaged ma man, wounded person carrying this barrel. You know, the barrel has a special meaning now. <clears throat> and that the other one is, I mean, is again, Bandhu is covering himself with uh, crackers, firecrackers, mm -hmm. and you don't see it, but you would uh, go into the public, into the place with a with a candle, with a lighted candle, with fire in his hand. So it's like you know he's going to explode at any moment. Mm -hmm. That's how we used to live in Sri Lanka, and that's I'm sure right now people in Kalambu is living with that. There yeah. will be an explosion anywhere in place. So Bandhu was you know making this tension, right. because one thing that I believe. Is what, I, what uh, this famous uh, feminist art historian called this concentrationary memory. You cannot, you should never forget these things. You should keep reminding this. You should never forget the Holocaust. You must keep reminding it. If you forget it, you do it again. You, this, I'm like our uh, chief of army was saying just that in, in a BBC interview. Don't forget it. Don't forget the recent past. Keep reminding, it's concentrate your know, concentrationary memory. This is what Priscilla Pollock argues. Like, you know, this is what Bandhu is doing, like you know, no, this could happen anytime. So it happened in Sri Lanka after ten years. Mm -hmm. You didn't think that it would happen, no? I know. It's terrible. Okay. Mm -hmm. This so is this is yeah, I'll just show both these works so you can uh, address them. Yeah, you know, look, see when these things happen. How do we think about this guy, this idea, this person called the soldier? Can, can we think him as an enemy? What is his role? What do we do? Like, of course it is the soldiers who did all these atrocities. But at the same time, the whole question is, who are you soldier? We can never have a concrete uh, answer, a clear answer to who are you soldier. Because the thing is this, you know, I said all these artists, he's also a student of mine, they came from a particular class. It is from that class most of the soldiers came, you know. Most of those soldiers of lower rank soldiers came from those, those families. So we had so many soldiers who were our friends, who were also our enemy. Like, you know, so then this, also in my work, I also did this you know, whole series of painting, who are you soldier? You cannot, con you know, he's, a, he's also a victim of, of the entire system. You know, we have to live with that... Uh, uh -huh. The ambiguity. Ambiguity, like, you, you, like, you know, know. Who's your enemy? You, you, know, he, really you cannot say, think that the, uh, the mm -hmm. same men, suicide bombers, they are not monsters. They are also human beings. 
like you know all these suicide bombers. It's very easy to condemn them. No, they are all they are. You know, someone is blowing yourself for a cause. Like he's also a human being, like you and me. You know, it's, condemning them is not going to take us anywhere. Making them un understand, we have to understand. We have to engage with it. So the idea of the soldiers, the one way the government or the status quo or the nationalist thinking is engaging with the soldiers is by calling them the war heroes. When you die, you go to heaven. So we have this, you know, we are attacking the religion and the idea of divinity in this. But no, there's another human way of dealing with it. You know, we, we always take the identity, the individual identity, individual, individual suffering away from the idea of soldier. No, we have to put it back. This is this is this. Argument. And this is a and this is really what this yeah. artist, a student of yours, is addressing, like this yeah. disappearing did. of yeah. identity into like that of a soldier. And then this, um, the yeah. picture is not very clear, but yeah. this is a very effective yeah, very, work. Very, yeah, um, very effective work. You see, when the soldiers get uh, crippled. They, they, they are special houses for them, schemes for them. Like they, are, they are called war hero houses for, for war heroes. So when you are in there, you are not wearing the uniform. You are wearing a particular kind of a sarong or a lungi that has this design. So this artist, so mm -hmm. these lungi so the designs. Striped cloths are the ones yeah, that yeah. represent this very specific type of convalescent. Yeah, yeah. Type so of this, the, the war uniform. hero is, is, is now crippled. Mm -hmm. And you know he's putting it this with the camouflage, uh, you know, designs and, and the striped uh, sarong, so the lungi is. This, yeah, this is uh, this Prishpukumar uh, correlated. Right? He did this series work called Goodwill Hardware. You see, soon after the war, 2009, there were so many uh, internally displaced camels were put into these camps. And in the southern, in the news, would, would present it that you know they are living a good life in these camps, which is not. So he was making this fun title like the Goodwill Hardware. So he, these stripes, you know, the blue, <coughs> white, red. This is the UN uh, when the UN gives you uh, tents for the basically, it's like the tarp that was given yeah. out. Um, and then, things relief, you know. But then they are, they are, they are always in this confined barbed, you know, these areas, these with, with barbed wires. So. What he did was he encased this barbed wires in this tube, so you can actually touch it. You will feel very, very comfortable. But it is, it is not so. Like you know, so it's called uh, goodwill hardware. But you can believe that you know nobody wants this art. <laughs> so this was this is sort of one of some of the more recent materials yeah, come yeah, out. Yeah. Like yeah, after two thousand nine, really, two thousand nine, right? yes. Yeah. After the, yeah. Um, Look at this point in my work. Celestial uh, violence and uh, celestial violence series, and this work are all responding to what uh, the, the popular thoughts that came to dominate, dominate, dominate soon after the war. You know, asking people to be more critical. About it. <coughs> mm -hmm. And I think um, I don't know how we are on time, but maybe this is now a good time. You know, I know that there will probably be lots so of questions deep. for you. Maybe um, maybe we'll stop here. <laughs> oh, there's so much more, you know, that we could show you and sort of even, you know, where sort of art practices are moving, you know, and every art practice is in Jaffna, but I think maybe, um, you know, there might be some questions that um, anybody wants to ask. Yes? Well, I have a question. Have you talked with your peers who've been in similar situations, say, after Rwanda or Argentina after the 1970s, where there were the, the civil disturbances and, or, or civil changes, and they probably impacted the artists and the culture and the psyche? Is it yeah, yeah, we have, you know, uh, as, Bindu was, as Bindu mentioned, I'm part of a group called Tears the International Artist Collective, and we are part of a wider Artist collective called Arts Collaboratory. So we we work closely with artists in South America, um, in, in Africa, um, India, in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we at some point we were thinking that we are making an alternative government of artists in South Asia. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. This you know, but I have to tell you, you know, these things are not just happening because I taught something. No, we were part of a larger group. 
you know, there was there was exchange of ideas with Indian artists, Pakistani artists, Bangladeshi, and you know, or South African artists coming how, to say. How does social media, does social media speed things up? Does it make the the interactions faster? So, no, like this was 1990s. You know, social media was not uh, uh, early not so much. Not so much. <laughs> it's now it is. Yes. Well, you you even have you know some artists who sort of document you know some of their hmm. um, you know whose artwork exists yeah. you know on like Twitter and these hmm. kinds of things you know like Halik like, um, yeah, we have one now who's <laughs> actually doing that yeah yes Ravi um, so uh, in several of the artworks uh, I I noticed sort of religious references like uh, in your um, the, the monument to the innocents, the, the walls seem to have saffron yeah. paint on the walls, and, and which is a religious re reference, or uh, Bandu Manam Peri's uh, uh, Nirvana, instant Nirvana. And in, in a way, it's sort of subverting the religious reference. And um, so, how is this seen in Sri Lanka by? By non-intellectuals, or uh, you know, you know, uh, because because uh, I think certain people can understand it, and but how is it seen by the general public, or is it even seen or noticed um, when you when you do this? But you see, like you know, we have our own detractors. Well, no. Yes. So, I mean, like in India, for I haven't heard of any incidents actually in Sri Lanka where you've had thugs breaking into exhibitions, you know, because they're offended by some of your imagery. Whereas that has definitely happened in India yeah, yeah, with some yeah. of these Hindutva, you know, people who object to, you know, the desecration of what they perceive to be religious imagery. Yeah, but yeah. is that happening? It's, it's no, not as such as much, and it, not in that uh, ter terrible manner. But the what is this is how it is happening. Most people think that we are funded by some some international uh, uh, conspiracy to denigrate Sri Lanka. That's you know that, that is how, how, that is the general way that they, especially because I'm educated um, in Washington D.C. That's one <laughs> argument that they are giving. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, which is nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and the. Other and the, um, uh, sometimes we have had problems with with monks, but I must tell you, you know, I'm, we are also not most of these people, but few of us are well connected. So when we have problems, we have uh, people in <laughs> in power, in position to, to to protect us, because you know even the current prime minister, you know, I have access to him, like you know, when Chandra Kumarathi was the president. But you know, when we were in trouble, you know. But we could, uh, but we buttressed ourselves by making it uh, this artist collective. So we made uh, made our own niche mm -hmm. to work within. And well, it's like because the you know, because all these people are coming from a particular class. They are not alien to the common uh, common people. They are the common people if they were not doing this. So whenever there are arguments and attacks and criticism, they can you know they can negotiate that very well because they are not if it is, they are not George Keats, they are not Darren others. You know, they are the the general public. So you see, like you know, Kumar is coming from you know, rural village in Kanji. So you know, can you, yeah, this is this is what I have to say, Ravi. Yeah, there are, but you know, we have a way of you know dealing with it. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Chaga, for, you know, for sharing so much of this history um, and your own sort of personal engagement with all of this material. It's been very interesting for me, and I hope it has been for our guests here. Thank you. Thank you. Susan for mm -hmm. making this happen, Susan yes. Bailey for today, and also Saskia Fernandez.